Hello and welcome to this video on urinary tract anatomy where we will cover the kidneys, ureters, bladder and urethra. Let's start with the kidneys. The kidneys can be found bilaterally in the abdominal cavity. They sit in the retroperitoneal space, i.e. they are not within the peritoneum, which is a thin lining that coats most intra-abdominal organs. They can be found at the vertebral level T12 to L3, with the right kidney sitting slightly lower due to the liver. They're around 12 centimeters in length, or around three vertebrae. Each kidney also has an adrenal gland sitting on its superior pole. Let's have a look at the anatomical structure of the kidney's layers. This image is drawn in the coronal plane, as if looking at the body from the feet end. I'll label some bits of anatomy to help you get orientated. There you go. This is a brilliant plane to demonstrate the layers of the kidneys. Also, Notice here how the kidney is behind the peritoneum, i.e. its retroperitoneal. The outermost layer of the kidney, though mainly found on the posterior surface of the kidney, is paranephric fat. The next lining is garotis fascia, which is a lining of connective tissue that holds the kidneys in place, as well as holding in the next lining of the kidneys, the perinephric fat. The perinephric fat is thought to have shock absorbing properties for kidney protection. And the inner lining is the renal capsule, a tough fibrous layer. Next, let's look at the anatomy of the renal parenchyma. Parenchyma just means tissue that performs the main function of an organ. In the kidneys, the outer parenchyma is called the cortex, which is adherent to the renal capsule and the more internal parenchyma is the medulla. The parenchyma is organised into multiple renal lobules, which are individual structures made of the outer cortex surrounding a triangular portion of inner medulla, known as a renal pyramid. The cortex projects in between renal pyramids to form columns. The tip of each pyramid is called the papilla, and this is where urine drains out of the parenchyma and into the minor calyces. Multiple minor calyces combine to form a major calyx, which in turn drains into the renal pelvis. Urine is formed in the nephrons of the kidneys. These are microscopic structures that span both the cortex and medulla. Each kidney has around 1 million nephrons, and in 24 hours, all the nephrons in both kidneys will filter 200 litres of blood to remove waste products, maintain acid balance, regulate electrolyte levels, and maintain blood pressure. We won't go into too much depth into nephron function, as this moves into the realms of physiology, but I will give an overview of nephron microanatomy. Blood is filtered in the renal corpuscle, which is made of the glomerulus, which is a tuft of blood vessels, and the Bowman's capsule, which collects the filtrate from the blood. From here, the filtrate travels down the proximal convoluted tubule, the loop of Henle, and the distal convoluted tubule. Throughout these sections of the nephron, the contents of the filtrate is being altered through reabsorption and secretion of various molecules the kidney is trying to hold onto or remove from the body. Finally, the filtrate reaches the collecting duct before traveling as urine into the renal pelvis. The blood supply to the kidneys comes from the two renal arteries, one supplying each kidney. The renal arteries are direct branches of the abdominal aorta. Since the abdominal aorta lies slightly left of the midline, the left renal artery is shorter than the right, where the right has to cross the inferior vena cava posteriorly. Each renal artery enters the kidney at the renal hilum which is essentially the access point to the kidney at its medial edge. Each artery divides into the anterior branch, which carries 75% of blood from the renal artery, and the posterior branch, which carries 25% of the blood. There is an anatomical plane in the kidney, known as the avascular plane of Brodel, that lies between the anterior and posterior branches of the renal artery. 
It's found slightly posterior to the lateral edge of the kidney and is relatively avascular. This makes it a useful anatomical landmark to aim for in procedures such as nephrostomy insertion. After dividing into the anterior and posterior renal artery, the blood vessels subdivide further into segmental arteries. There are five of these per renal artery, with each supplying a different segment of the kidney. Each segmental artery further divides and gives rise to interloba arteries, which are situated either side of the renal pyramid. These branch further to form arcuate arteries, then interlobular arteries, followed by afferents and efferent arterioles in the renal corpuscle. These then form peritubular capillaries for excretion and reabsorption of waste and nutrients. From here, blood is drained from the kidney in the respective veins, where the deoxygenated blood eventually reaches the inferior vena cava. It's also important to note that there's considerable anatomical variation between individuals' renal blood supply. For example, some individuals may have multiple renal arteries. The renal pelvis continues to form the ureter, which is a smooth muscle tube that drains urine from the kidney to the bladder using peristaltic contractions. There is one ureter per kidney, each around 20 to 30 centimeters in length. The section of ureter that arises from the renal pelvis is called the pelvi-ureteric junction. The ureters descend in the abdomen as retroperitoneal structures. They enter the pelvis as they pass over the pelvic brim, located at the sacroiliac joints. The ureters then enter the posterior surface of the bladder, forming the vesico-ureteric junctions. The distal end of the ureters has a mucosal flap that acts as a one-way valve, preventing reflux of urine from the bladder back up to the ureters. These three points in the ureter are also the most narrow along its passage, and are therefore where renal stones are most likely to get stuck. The ureter's blood supply comes from multiple origins, thanks to its ascending course from the pelvis to the posterior abdominal wall during embryological development. The abdominal portion of the ureters receives blood from the renal artery, testicular or ovarian artery, and ureteral branches of the abdominal aorta. The pelvic portion receives blood from the superior and inferior vesical arteries. Next, let's have a look at the bladder, which collects urine drained from the kidneys. The bladder is an intraperitoneal muscular organ in the pelvis. It's needed for temporary storage of urine and, hopefully, when the time is right, assists with expelling it. The bladder is distensible, and its shape therefore changes with the volume of urine it stores. When full, it's oval-shaped, and when empty, it's flattened by the pressure within the abdominal cavity. The gross anatomy of the bladder can be divided into the apex, which is the superior portion, connected to the umbilicus via the median umbilical ligament the fundus, which is found posteriorly, the body, which is located between the apex and the fundus, and the neck, which elongates in shape to form the urethra. The inner lining of the bladder contains folds, called rugae, which allow the bladder to expand as it feels. Urine will enter the bladder via the ureters at the vesico ureteric junctions, and exits by the internal urethral orifice. These three openings form an anatomical area known as the trigone. The main blood supply to the bladder is from the superior vesical artery, which is a branch of the internal iliac artery. Let's have a look at the bladder wall. The inner lining of the bladder is the mucosal layer which is made up of transitional epithelium, a type of epithelium designed to change shape in response to stretching. External to the mucosal layer is the detrusor muscle. 
This is a smooth muscle with fibres orientated in multiple planes to allow it to maintain its structure whilst fully stretched. The function of the detrusor muscle is to contract and force urine out through the urethra during urination. The superior and posterior wall of the bladder are also covered with a layer of visceral peritoneum. The urethra has two muscular sphincters. The internal urethral sphincter in males is made of smooth muscle and functions to prevent retrograde movement of semen during ejaculation. As it's made of smooth muscle, it's under autonomic control, i.e. non-conscious control. The internal urethral sphincter in females does not contain muscle, but is anatomically formed by the bladder neck and proximal urethra. The external urethral sphincter is made of skeletal muscle, and it therefore is under somatic, or conscious, control. There are multiple motor and sensory nerves supplying the bladder, which contribute to our control of micturition. Motor nerve supply can be divided into somatic, which supplies muscles under conscious control, and autonomic, which we don't have conscious control over. The somatic nerve supply to the bladder is via the pudendal nerve, which innervates the external urethral sphincter. You have to consciously relax its muscle to allow urine to pass. The autonomic supply can be further subdivided into sympathetic branch made of the hypogastric nerve, which causes relaxation of the detrusor muscle to allow urine retention, and the parasympathetic branch, which is made of the pelvic nerve, causing contraction of the detrusor muscle to help with expelling urine from the bladder. The pelvic nerve also controls the internal urethral sphincter, which will cause relaxation of the smooth muscle in males, allowing urine to pass. The sensory nerves are those which carry information from the bladder to the central nervous system. There are neurons connecting the bladder to the brain, which allows us to feel when our bladder is full, and these are generally stimulated when the bladder reaches around 200 mils. But there are also sensory neurons that only reach the spinal cord and then loop back round to the pelvic nerve without reaching the brain. This is known as the bladder stretch reflex. This is a non-conscious process which causes the detrusor muscles to contract when the bladder wall is stretched by urine. This process is generally overridden after we've been toilet trained as children. However, spinal cord injuries above T12 can result in loss of conscious bladder control from the brain, resulting in the bladder stretch reflex taking control again. The urethra is the anatomical tube that connects the internal urethral orifice to the external environment, allowing expulsion of urine from the body. The urethra is lined with columnar epithelium, which allows for mucus production to protect itself from being damaged by urine. The female urethra is around 4cm in length. It passes from the bladder neck through the pelvic floor and opens in the vestibule of the perineum. The male urethra is around 20cm in length and anatomically is subdivided into three parts. The prostatic urethra is the most proximal part which descends through the prostate, where it also receives contents from the ejaculatory ducts of the prostate. The middle part is short and known as the membranous urethra, which passes through the pelvic floor and is surrounded by the external urethral sphincter. The most distal portion is the bulbous urethra, which passes through the penis and opens at a dilation called the navicular fossa. Thanks for watching and see you next time.